Welcome everyone. I'm Renee, Schomburg Township Library's Senior Services Coordinator. And we have a very special guest today, Nev March. And she is the author of Murder in Old Bombay. And she has another book coming out soon. So this is her first novel, thoroughly enjoyed by my book club members. And thank you so much for sharing your time with us. You're very welcome, very pleased to be here. I hear you have some ties to the Chicago land area. Oh yeah, so when I migrated from India, I came as a foreign student in 1991. I actually came to Northern Illinois. <laughs> they were very kind to give me a, a scholarship and I was a teaching assistant. I taught economics, econ um, 206, I think it was. And I have to, tell you there's two people in the Rockford area in the Schaumburg area too that um, two families that were so kind to me I owe them such a debt uh, the walk family darling darling people who kind of adopted me <laughs> and the Tata family uh, Shiraz and Spiti were wonderful so thank you to both of them I found your personal story so interesting because of the concept of change and how you left the corporate world to follow your passion, writing and teaching. And there's certainly a lot of ups and downs in the corporate world and a lot of change going on. And sometimes when those change ha changes happen, it's very scary, but all of a sudden, you know, the focus of our life can be totally different. Very much so. Uh, I've had a lot of change, but you know, you can't, you can't run from change. <laughs> Um, in my 20s, I migrated. That's a huge change. And this is an era before cell phones, right? So I didn't know a single person uh, before I came to um, Chicago. So yeah, that was a huge um, earth-shaking change for me. Uh, I've had other changes and, and not all were good. <laughs> in the 30s, in my 30s, I had a major accident. I was laid up um, with multiple broken bones I was actually expecting my second son, who is in the photograph behind me, so he was fine, um, but I was in a wheelchair for a long time. So yeah, uh, you know, change finds you. <laughs> um, but other change, professionally, I you know, had a very successful 20-year career in uh, corporate America. I was doing analysis, using my degrees, you know, using my education, um, quantitative analysis, and so on. And while I was working, I, you know, had the sense that I could do something more. And these stories kept sort of echoing in my head, uh, reverberating. They just wouldn't go away. So I started writing them down. But it was a hobby. really didn't do anything with it. I just uh, wrote them. But then 2015 comes around and I got laid off. And I'd be, you know, a high performer. I had been a member of such a valued team and suddenly, boom, the whole team's gone. So yeah, you know, change finds you. <laughs> so I did at that time do some soul searching and uh, my parents needed me for their medical care. So I went up and down to India multiple times in those years, 2014, actually, even 15, 17, 19, uh, multiple times and realized that I, I wasn't going to be able to continue in a corporate career because I couldn't even stick around for the second interview sometimes, right? Um, so I started writing and joined a writing club in my library, <laughs> my local library. God bless them. They were such a boon. And yeah, this book came out of it. That team, the, the group in the library reviewed every chapter that you see in that book. One chapter a week, I'd print it out and bring it eight or 10 copies and, and I'd read it out. It's about seven pages, roughly. My chapters are very short. And around the table, they'd go and tell me, you know, what they thought. I, I got such wonderful feedback from them. So yeah, change finds you. <laughs> it certainly did. I think this book crosses so many different lines um, in terms of genre and it crosses them so well, I would say, part historical fiction, mystery, romance, the, the history, 
of the rich history um, of India in the 1890s. Um, did you set out to cover all these bases or did it just unfold naturally? It came naturally. I did have an outline, Renee. I had a very nice, clean outline. It was going to be a mystery. Uh, all the clues were laid out. Um, and then the book decided it was going to go elsewhere. <laughs> so I usually grumbled at Captain Jim hijacked my the mid part of my book because I created this character that you know had um, a sense of adventure and couldn't turn away when somebody needed his help and so also if you remember we get derailed when we're trying to do something so why shouldn't he right so he he gets derailed half a dozen times the point is he keeps coming back he keeps coming back to it and I thought that was a nice quality to have and to, to encourage um, and to say, yeah, stuff happens in your life. You can't avoid that, but you can keep coming back. So the book did have a life of its own. They don't go according to plan, Renee. <laughs> Mine don't. <laughs> and uh, I also want to point out that, that India, India, colonial India is a character in the book. It's a very dominant character, actually. So it's, that's why we write historical fiction is because the book belongs to that era and that era actually matters that that story could not have happened in any other time or place. The history of that place is intrinsically part of the plot. So it, it, it felt right to have him searching for clues all over India. <laughs> Indeed. You've been nominated for numerous awards and you have the Mystery Writers of America First Novel Award that you have received. Can you tell us a little bit about what that felt like and how that unfolded? Oh my gosh, it was, I say it was a dream come true and, and I mean it. I had been pitching, so I had written the book, I had been editing it for almost a year. I'd been pitching, so I learned how to do the query letter and so on, and I'm sending it out. I sent it out to 120 agents and mostly got declines. And now I know it was because the book was too long. <laughs> it was 138,000 words, which is about 38% too long for a novel. Uh, but I had written it and I was pitching it and nothing happened, right? So I was getting a little frustrated and disappointed actually. So uh, I was in the gym working out and in between sets, I looked at my email and found this email from Mystery Writers of America. Hey, Navaz, you won this, uh, you know, wonderful uh, award. And I'm going, wait, I won it. I, I've actually won it. And so I sent it to my agent with the title, yikes. <laughs> so I was driving back and she said, yeah, yeah this is where you want to be. Minotaur is part of Macmillan and Nev. This is exactly where you want to be. Um, they are the largest publisher of detective fiction in the world. Oh my God, they invited me to the Edgar Awards. This is like going to the Oscars, okay? When you're a newbie actor and you're suddenly invited, not just to attend, to speak. <laughs> uh, it was a total trip, it was incredible. And, and I, I feel so indebted to Mystery Writers of America uh, I joined their board for the Northeast um, New York chapter, and we're actually creating a program so that I can help connect people to create critique groups within the community of mystery writers. I figured, hey, you know, they did such a good job for me <laughs> I got to do something back for them. Right. And it's wonderful to bounce things off of people, and they have a lot of good wisdom and advice. So... That's very interesting. So then for Murder in Old Bombay, um, we don't wanna give out any spoilers here, but I understand that you heard the story of two women being thrown off of a clock tower way back when, as you grew up. And did, that, did you ever think you would bring that story to life? And can you shed some light on that? Absolutely. I was a teenager and, you know, in Mumbai, I'd, I'd want to do certain things. I want to do adventurous things. I was going to college. I wanted to join the hiking and mountaineering society. And it involved an overnight trip with boys. 
it was going to be chaperone. I was convincing my parents everything would be fine. And of course, it was there was no no way. But my parents used to code. You know, a very conservative family. So you you'd use certain words to try and tell you know that girls aren't safe. Explain that girls aren't always safe. You have to be careful. So they'd use these words saying, remember the Godridge girls. And that's the family that really lost those two girls. And so I knew something bad had happened to them. It's the idea that you're not safe, even in daytime, you're not entirely safe. You have to be really vigilant and careful. But I didn't know exactly what had happened to them. <laughs> you know, it, it was it's like something has happened about 10 years ago, who knows? Uh, I did hear that they had fallen. It was considered to be suicide, although there was no um, clear resolution. It was an unsolved mystery at that point. I mean, we're talking about 1970s and 80s. Nobody knew. Uh, they, the belief was that these girls had committed suicide. They had fallen from the clock tower in the middle of Bombay University, in the middle of four o'clock in the afternoon, broad daylight, and never solved. And then later on, in 2016, I was reading about it, and I found out that this actually happened in 1891, in fact. So it had already been 80 years or 90 years old by the time we were talking about it when I was a teenager. But the community talked about it as if it had just happened. So it was very much in our living memory at that point. So writing the story, researching it, I went into all the details and got a little obsessed with it. And I have to tell you, it, it gave me a sense of tremendous satisfaction, relief to have an explanation because it could have happened this way. That, that's the crazy part is I have all the uh, factions of the time, you know, in, with the long lens of history, some things become clearer. And what might not have been clear at that time is now very, very transparent because there were these um, opposing forces with growing nationalism very early on, but also a sense of you know, regret and anger at what had happened during the mutiny, 1860s. Uh, just about when America was going through its civil war, India was going through a civil war. And so there were these resentments lingering in the 1890s. So putting it all together and knowing how the girls might have behaved and the the troubles of the time gave me an enormous sense of satisfaction that, you know, it could just have happened this way. I have no proof. <laughs> so you did some traveling to investigate and what places, museums, libraries, um, where did you travel to? And any interesting stories from your travels? Yeah, absolutely. I'll tell you the story about the tower itself. <laughs> I did I did travel a little bit. Um, I took my parents back to Pune, where my mom had grown up. We visited some of those areas. They've changed dramatically. But the sense of place was, was very much there. Uh, you know, Mathiran, there are, are places in Mumbai that are, in, in India, that are indelibly etched in my mind. And I spent a lot of time with mom in the hospital as well. So I was going back in my memory to places we had traveled to as a family when I was young. And I think childhood memories are always uh, etched so clearly with such sensory detail that I just allowed myself the, the luxury of nostalgia, you know, when you don't have to worry about going cooking or going shopping or going, you know, somebody's gonna make a phone call and you're just in the hospital, there's nowhere to go, there's no Wi-Fi, <laughs> you know, I could just let myself really steep in those old memories, but I did go, I got special permission to go to the university clock tower where it all happened. It is close to the public, so um, I wrote letters and they were ignored, and I showed up and I locked myself down on a chair and pretty much refused to leave until somebody gave me an explanation and said, come back again, come back again. So I went up the tower, I got special permission and I went up with a lady guard, uh, a lay female guard, again, for my safety, right? Um, it was 95 degrees in the shade and we were climbing 200 stairs uh, and it was suffocating. I, halfway up, I realized Nev, you're actually claustrophobic, you know? 
<laughs> this is not a good place for you to be because a lot of the air holes had been blocked out, had been you know cemented over for because birds would get in. In fact, when we got to the top, we actually climbed over a bird's nest. <laughs> and right at the top where we should have opened the door and got out of the gallery, that's where the event had happened, where the girls fell from uh, or were thrown, the door was locked. And my lady guard said, they didn't give me the key <laughs> because they were afraid that I, the author, <laughs> might be, you know, suicidal or whatever. They're trying to save me from myself. So all that work. Um, anyway, I took a lot of videos and photographs there on the website. There's a tab on my nevmarch.com has a tab showing you just how, you know, scary those stairs were. And as you go down, there's these resonance chambers that you pass. Uh, I took some photographs there, just, uh, you know, ancient architecture, but beautifully done. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was very poignant. And the sense that I was on the same steps that they had crossed, you know, for the last time, that was, um, that was compelling. I also have a scene in the book somewhere where Captain Jim's charging up and I realized, you know what, he'd have a hard time because I had stone, I was passing stone on either side, like my elbows were touching stone. And he's a bigger guy than I am. It's only maybe a foot of air above my head. And I'm, you know, I'm just above four or five feet. So he would have had a hard time dashing up those stairs. But it brought it very vividly to my mind. I did a lot of research, though, on the Internet. I read um, stories about Victoria Cross and uh, Medal of Honor, um, you know, awardees. But learned about the skirmishes, learned about the Afghan wars. Um, lots that I could find in libraries, but also lots that I could find on the internet. And then uh, I actually mined some of my own family history as well. I won't tell you much more because it'll be a spoiler, but the secret at the heart of murder in Old Bombay is actually my family secret, <laughs> something that we preserved for 150 years. And it's in the author's notes, so uh, you know, don't worry if you if you don't know right now. At the end of the book, read the author's notes, and you'll you'll know. Right, we won't do spoilers. Yeah. So the main family members are Zoroastrian, mm -hmm. and your book deals with people fitting in, people not fitting in, um, but it also deals with acceptance and welcoming. Can you? Tell us a bit about the Zoroastrians in India and the family and how they fit into India's society. Sure. So the Parsis, also called the Zoroastrians, um, they're the followers of prophet Zoroaster, who's a Persian, ancient Persian prophet, um, pre-Christian, uh, pre Pre-Judaic um, prophet. We were not sure how, you know, which year he was born. Uh, some go as far back as 3000 BC, uh, others more recent than that. Um, there is some archaeological evidence, but nothing conclusive. So during the Arab conquest, which is 600 AD, um, the Persians got converted to Islam, a lot of them, and then a few, in order to preserve their religion, they escaped on boats we don't know how many boats left the Straits of Hormuz, but a couple of boats did arrive in Sanjan in Gujarat in India. And so all the Zoroastrians that are alive today, and we think there are about 100,000, are either the descendants of the people from those boats or a few groups, few families who stayed behind in Yazd and Kerman in Persia, in Iran, even in caves um, and try to preserve their religion. And we think there's approximately 5,000 Zoroastrians still left in Iran uh, who have maintained their religion through enormous sacrifice, enormous hardships. So most of the 95,000 <laughs> are the descendants of those um, Zoroastrians who came to India. And because they came from Pars, they were called Parsi, <laughs> that's person from Pars. And that group is not Hindu, right? Because it's a separate religion. So it's kind of outside of the caste system 
of India. Now, our Hindu caste system has these different uh, functional areas, and the the lowest class have been deprived and and um, you know exploited for centuries until Mahatma Gandhi then kind of gave them a name called Harijan, God's people, and, and uplifted them. Um, and casteism has been officially abolished in India, but it very much exists. It very much dominates Indian cultural society. Even though in the cities, people do mix with other castes. Uh, you do have other religions. Islam is there, there's Christianity, there's uh, Jewish community there, there's Buddhists. Um, India has been so welcoming to so many religions and, and been enriched by them. So the Zoroastrians landed up in India and became quite educated, became some of the best administrators and so on of the princely states as well as of the British Raj. <laughs> uh, in the, ended up becoming industrialists and helping promote the wealth of the country. So if you look at the history of the Parsis, it's, it's, it's enormous. The contributions to India are enormous. Um, but it's a very, very tiny community. And um, I, I'm sorry to say I belong to it, but I'm sorry to say it's slightly elitist. And so this book also has a little bit of an indictment of my own community because it's, it's a plea. It's, I'm begging them to change. One of the characters who I felt was a very strong character, uh, Chutki, and one of the main characters in the book befriends this little girl. And I understand there's an inspiration for that character um, of someone that you saw when you were in India. Yeah, I, I won't forget her. And it's strange because our connection lasted all of maybe 30 seconds. Um, but um, again, there are these moments in your life that, that um, even at the time you may not be aware, but they, they change you. So I was a student, I was standing in a line for a bus across Bandra station and bus didn't come. So I was, you know, looking around and there is this girl, not even a woman, a, a girl sitting with a baby in her lap. She might've been 15, 16, 17, I don't know, maybe even 18. And she's sitting across from me, um, maybe 30 feet away. And in India, you're programmed to not look beggars in the eye. You, you just can't make eye contact. But I did, and I was looking at her, she looked at me. And, and there was an expression. This is again, one of these things that you, there are no words for. There was an expression of desperation, of, of despair, of something, a gloom so heavy that it's hard to describe. But so I'm thinking, okay, I've got 10 rupees in my purse. If this is okay. This is like, you know, 50 cents. Okay. And I need probably about, I don't know, a few rupees to take the bus because I had to pay for my bus ticket. Well, can I, can I find some money to give this woman? And, you know, just looking at her, her look changed and something in it was like, I'm not giving up. There was a sense of her lifting up herself and saying, you know, I'm, I'm not giving up. There was a sort of reclaiming of herself. Uh, again, this is just without words. This is in 30 seconds. I'm just looking at her and the bus came and I got shoved on the bus and I carried on home. But that, that moment of I'm not giving up, that stayed with me. I don't know who the baby was. I don't know if it was her baby or it was somebody's baby or she had given the baby to beg with. I, I don't know anything about her, but yet in a, in a look, I knew who she was. And I think I preserve that in Chutki. You know, she's so beat up this girl, but uh, you know, there are moments, you know, there, there are giggles. There are, I, I, I loved her. <laughs> I um, also, I was drawn also to the covers of your books. And can you tell us a little bit about um, how you selected the covers, how the publisher, how you worked with the publisher? Renee, you're gonna laugh. <laughs> I had a, a cover, a preliminary cover. I was messing around on canva.com 
And I had this creepy looking clock tower, blue and black. And, you know, I was trying to find out how I could have somebody falling from it. And uh, it was supposed to be spooky, you know, usual gothic kind of a look. And so I had described that to the design group at Macmillan. And they sent me this completely opposite. <laughs> it's sunny. It's beautiful. It's joyful. It's got the heat of Bombay in it. And um, it's such an uplifting cover. I'm going, what? And I loved it. I just loved it. So I had them do two, make two changes. The clock tower, I had them insert it right on the top left because it doesn't actually belong near that building. <laughs> Took a little artistic freedom and said, I want the clock tower on the title, it, it, near the title in the page right there. And then somewhere in the foreground, there's a um, red coat. There's a guy in a uh, uh, you know, army uniform, and that's Captain Jim. I had them insert him right next to the donkey cart. <laughs> so he's there in the midst of a busy Bombay street. Um, those were my two minor edits. Everything, all the credit goes to them. Macmillan took an old uh, postcard and colorized it and used it as the inspiration for the picture. And curiously enough, they did the same thing for the second book, Peril at the Exposition, which is set in Chicago. The characters in your book, they go so beyond society's norms, you know, for the time and about who we're supposed to be dating. Um, the, the book covers class, it covers caste, post-traumatic stress of wartime, and shows the sensitivities of the outsider. But yet you've got the powerful female in Diana who goes beyond, way beyond what's expected of her at the time. Um, how did you develop these strong characters and their vulnerabilities as well? Yeah, so it, it's a balance. I wanted to be true to the time. So women were um, significantly restricted uh, in the 1800s, much of the 1900s, and even today in many ways, um, there are enormous societal limitations on not just uh, you know, where we can and cannot go, but who we could marry and so on. Um, in fact, there's a tragic character, Rati Pettit, uh, from the 1940s really, um, she was Sir Dinshaw Pettit's daughter, and some of the troubles of the time of, that I've captured in the book are very much related to her real life story. Uh, Rati Pettit basically fell in love with her father's friend, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, and Jinnah is the founder of Pakistan, was in his 40s, well-educated, extremely handsome, uh, erudite man. Uh, she was 16 when she met him. She married him at 18. The family, the Pettit family, Sardin Shah Pettit were, was um, horrified because of the age gap, but also Muhammad Ali Jinnah being a Muslim, not a Parsi. Uh, essentially, they abandoned her. And Rati um, tried to make it with her husband's family, who was very orthodox, I believe, and um, didn't quite get along. Uh, ended up living in the Taj Mahal Hotel, her the Pettit family were friends with the Tada family and they gave her a space to live in the hotel. And, and she died very young. She died within a few years because she'd been essentially abandoned. Um, you know, it's a tragic story about community not supporting a girl, a, a woman, because she broke their rules. So I have Diana, who is um, spunky. She's a representation of all the naughty girls I knew <laughs> growing up. A little bit of my own uh, alter ego, maybe my wishful thinking. She's more impulsive than I ever was, okay? But she's darling and she's had a taste of freedom. She's gone to England to have an education. Cornelia Saraji is India's first lady lawyer and she did in fact have this kind of education. So it was done at the time rare, but it was done. And so Diana comes back to uh, her family and has all these Western ideas. <laughs> and of course, the family has just had a tragic loss. So they are going to be extremely protective of her. So you have this balance now where she's trying to help and she's trying to go places and she's trying to do things and they want her to be safe and stay at home. And, 
And so there's this uh, push and pull. Patriarchal societies are uh, extremely hard on women. And, and that control comes both from the men as well as from the older women. <laughs> women do it too, you know? So to have that um, tension, that, that balance where everybody's trying to do the right thing and they just mess it up constantly because there are all these opposing forces. Um, that gave me a good sense of inner um, tension in, in, in the dynamic, in the family dynamic. Even though there are enormous bonds of love, there are these opposing needs that have to be met. So it's a partial answer, but you know, um, hopefully that will uh, give you a sense of where I was coming from in, in building Diana's character. Uh, she's, I have to tell you, the second book was taken over by Diana. She has a major voice in the second book and she was hard to write. Uh, she, she, her voice, her character is more complex, uh, more nuanced. There are all these inner eddying uh, emotions. She was hard to write. Captain Jim was very, very easy to write because he is such a sweetheart. He's so direct. He is so honest with himself uh, to a fault. But Diana is uh, spunky, but she's also terrified. She is uh, emotional, but she is also very thoughtful. Um, she's determined, but she's very aware of her shortcomings. So there's all these pieces I had to put together, which is quite hard. <laughs> So speaking of role, role models, you um, had lots of experiences and made huge changes in your own life. Uh, any words of encouragement to other people out there who are thinking of making changes in their life or uh, writing a book? Yeah, I do think we do have stories within us and we have to, to learn the craft of telling them, uh, you know, give yourself the time to learn the craft. Having an idea isn't enough. Uh, I do mentor a lot of young writers, almost one a month, almost sometimes more often. Um, and the key, my usual suggestion to them is give yourself the time to learn the craft. Don't think about having, I have one book and I'm going to market it and, and make it big. You have to learn the craft if you're going to have a long sustained career. Um, but I'll say even broader than that, in terms of change, I waited 20 years to be able to do this. I, I paid my dues. I, uh, you know, paid my bills. I did what I needed to. We saved so that I could take some time and work at my book. I didn't know if it was going anywhere. I, I didn't know if I would make a single dollar from it. And, and a lot of writers don't. That's the hard, honest truth. Uh, it is a very crowded market and it is hard to break in. But if you give yourself the time and bide your time, perhaps even until you're ready to do it, whatever it may be, whether it's in music or art or writing or any other occupation, bide your time, prepare yourself, and then go for it. We have a question here from a viewer who just started listening to the audiobook, and he or she says, how did you decide, uh, how did they cast the narrators? Oh, this was hard. So I described my main character because it's a first person point of view, right? So obviously I can't narrate it. You need a, a male narrator, somebody who has the mix of a British accent, but also a little bit of an Indian accent. And Captain Jim has been raised by British army officers, but he's also lived in India. So he has a mix. So he gave me a couple of voices and said, which one sounds like Captain Jim? <laughs> and um, Vic, was an instant, instant hit. I went, oh my God, he did a little um, audition, I think they call it, and I got an attachment in my email. I was like, oh my God, he's alive, he's alive. <laughs> it felt like Captain Jim. Of course, I gave him notes on how to pronounce certain things. So Vic Adam is, um, he's marvelous. He's such a nice guy. Uh, he has a Parsi mother. <laughs> So when he was asking me how these characters sounded, Barjor and Byram and all the rest of it, I said, well, do you remember what your grandfather sounded like? 
Barger sounds like your grandfather. And he had a good laugh over that. But he's uh, he's got a wonderful repertoire. There are over 20 characters. There are children. There are women. There are men of different ages. And he did them all. All those voices are one guy. His enormous performance. And he's up for an Audi Award, so I'm not surprised because the range is just uh, boggles the mind. <laughs> And they're all believable. So I, I, I thought you did a wonderful job. We have another question here about how extensively you've traveled in India. Yeah, so growing up, uh, I wasn't allowed to travel alone. It just, there was no uh, opportunity and it would not have been allowed. Um, but my parents did like to tour. So we went to Uti and Kurg. We went to uh, Pune often, Mathiran often as a family, or at least, you know, with one or two uh, family members, aunts and uncles. And then when I was uh, 16, I went to Kashmir with a school group alone <laughs> without the parents. <laughs> um, it was a phenomenal experience. We rode horses, we saw Dal Lake, we lived in a houseboat and um, had to manage my own money at 16, oh my God. Um, but that's this just before Kashmir closed to the public and before the insurgents and all the chaos happened and then in the 80s, it was a beautiful, beautiful place. So many of Captain Jim's travels as he goes up from Patan Kot and Simla, and they mirror what, what we did. We went on a bus, okay? We didn't go on horses up the mountains. We went on a bus, but those terrain, those, those areas, exist, uh, you know, Uttaranchal, Himachal Pradesh, beautiful mountainous um, villages and, and gorgeous scenery, are, they all exist. <laughs> so you had um, a section of your book that you wanted to read to us. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll kind of close with that. So feel free. Uh, so this is a chapter called Confrontation. It's in the first one third of the book. And it's about three pages that uh, gives you a sense of the key conflict <clears throat> of the book. Have a seat, Captain. Burjor indicated the settee and dropped into a chair. I sat down with growing concern. He'd been a generous host all evening, but now... His customary bonhomie was conspicuously absent. Had I given cause for rebuke? Searching my memory brought forth no clues. Had something occurred this very evening? A long pause followed in which he appeared to consider an opening. However, he did not speak. Instead, he rose and went to the alcove by his desk that contained his saint's portrait. There, he bent his head before it and prayed softly. Remonstrations I could have managed, even an uncalled for reprimand. His strange expression was fear? Surely not. Some deep-seated worry then. My puzzlement melted to compassion for my troubled host. Whatever it is, sir, let's have it, I said into the oppressive quiet. He returned after a few moments, his footsteps unwilling and slumped on the brocade seat. His deep-set eyes regarded me steadily. Sometimes I'm not sure, he began, that I'm doing the right thing. It helps to speak to the prophet. He motioned towards the alcove, saying, you know we are Parsis, of course. I nodded, further mystified at his choice of topic. He continued, but you may not know what that is. We are Zoroastrians, followed of that followers of that ancient prophet Zarathustra, pointing at the saint's portrait, he went on. We do not convert anyone to be Zoroastrian. Centuries ago, our ancestors came to Gujarat as refugees from Pars in Persia. We are very few, perhaps a few, a hundred thousand in all. I waited. This history did not explain the ominous tone of his interview. He said, so if a son or daughter marries someone who's not a Parsi, well, they can no longer continue the race. They are as good as lost to us. I offered, I've heard Mrs. Framji speak about it at breakfast. Yes, his voice lifted in palpable relief. So you see, well, no. 
My words drew him back into a fretful state. He rocked in his chair. Captain, you cannot marry Diana, he said finally. Whatever I had expected, it was not this. Astonishment gave way to bitterness. I was a mixed breed, a bastard, not worthy of his daughter. Had I not seen that mix of pity and disapproval all my life, Indians did not tolerate the mingling of races any more than the English. In polite circles, a man who was happy until then to shake my hand would hear my name, James Agniotri, and pause. His shoulders would stiffen and he might spot an acquaintance across the room and need to meet him. Women who seemed perfectly gracious, as they heard my Indian surname, their eyes might widen with understanding. Those quick glances of confirmation, how well I knew them and the reserve that followed, polite, distant, and final. But this from Barjor, whom I extolled as an exemplary father, that he thought so little of me cut deep. I wiped emotion from my face, but now he seemed attuned to me and grimaced an apology. No, Captain, it's not that. I see great merit in you. We owe you a great deal. You are not responsible for an accident of birth. His chest swelled with a heavy breath. No, it is Diana. Two brides were lost to us, to my clan, Captain. We cannot lose another. The creases around his mouth deepened. His voice dropped to a whisper. Our customs are all we have. He buried his head in his hands. This we cannot change, but why? Surely now he spoke to the saint rather than to me. I felt winded, out of breath from the unexpected punch to my gut. I hardly dared hope that Diana might come to care for me. Her light-hearted flirting this evening was no more than an affectation, common surely amongst young ladies of her class. Yet we had shared a tender moment as heady as the finest bourbon. I could still feel her closeness, the curve of her waist in my grip. When I moved to leave her fingers on my hand, staying me, echoed my own reluctance to end our dance. Clearly, Barjo's words were aimed to snuff out that flicker of hope. Moreover, he placed the responsibility upon me to distance myself from Diana. He could have forbade me, even dismissed me, but he had not. He'd simply asked me to leave her be with the father's prerogative, saying, young man, she's not for you. My ribs throbbed with a new ache. How could I answer? I felt heavy with regret. As I searched for words to voice my protest, I paused. Who else had he warned off? What else had he done? Borjor had just opened up a path for me to ask about Kasim. Since Manik's obscure remark implied some cruelty on Borjor's part, what better time to put the matter to rest? I understand, sir, I said. May I ask about a different matter? He looked up and appeared heartened. Of course, Captain, anything. Who is Kasim? Had I struck him in the face, I could not have shocked him more. His lips parted, his ruddy cheeks paled. Barjur's manner shouted both guilt and remorse. Was Manik right then? Had this good man harmed a lowly servant boy? And we'll stop there. Well, thank you so very much for being with us. We can't wait for your next book to come out. And I understand that that will be the summer. It's out in July, July 12th, Peril at the Exposition uh, will be at the bookstores. And uh, I do have book three in mind. It's um, in process right now, and that is scheduled for next summer. That's wonderful. Congratulations on your success. And thank you so much for being with us. Oh, it's been such a pleasure and thank you for having me.